Welcome to the Greencastle Baptist Church, the Church Under the Cross online Bible study experience. It is our prayer that God continues to bless and keep you. Greencastle Baptist Church is located at 4970 Murphy Lane in Louisville, Kentucky. Thank you for viewing our online Bible study experience. We will now join a recent Bible study. All right, we are going to uh, tonight uh, bring to a conclusion uh, our lesson on chapter three in um, the book of Ezra. And as you know, the Israelites have been set free from uh, their Babylonian captivity. Uh, King Cyrus of Persia, Persia is now in charge and God had put it on his heart to set the uh, captives free. And so they have come back to their homeland and the first thing that we know that they began with was praise and worship for the lord no they don't have a temple uh they have a um as you would say a a rough uh roughly constructed um uh, altar of stones in order to put their sacrifices on and to uh and, and it says that uh in we saw that in verses one through three it, it told us that uh, by doing this, they were able to uh, follow the law of Moses and the word of God, and they offered these sacrifices uh, morning and evening. Uh, and, and we kind of compared that to being um, if you were at home and um, you, you'd been away from home for a long time, you would look back and see uh, just how uh, difficult um, being away has been. So they have great joy in being back in their homeland. So now we, we have come to this part where they are celebrating uh, the Feast of Booths uh, because the people at this time are still living in tents uh, like they had done when they were in the wilderness. So uh, this continuing worship uh, on their part uh, as they have little and uh, they are not focused on themselves. They are only focused on God. So this continuing worship that we see here is in itself an act of faith. They are demonstrating faith that the Lord will be pleased by their obedience in spite of their inability to perform everything as required in the absence of the temple. They are demonstrating faith and courage by remaining in this city without walls. Uh, th this place was rough times, uh, like we have rough times. We would not wanna go out and live in a tent um, because uh, we would be scared of the harm that would come. But they, despite the threats of the other people around him, because other people don't care for them, uh, they continue to perform their worship service. Uh, we always talk about uh, a church without walls. Well. They, they truly have a church without walls. Uh, and though they feared the people, they, despite that fear, they still acted out of faith. A new work does not mean the abandonment uh, of all that has gone before. And, and that's kind of what we see in, uh, in verses uh, four through five uh, of uh, Ezra. So when, when we go back and we look at that, just to kind of uh, pull our attention uh, back to what Brother Ezra tells us, uh, he talks about them celebrating. He says that they have kept these feasts in the tabernacle and it is written and says, from the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, although the foundation of the temple had not been laid. So these people continue on. And, and so this is what spiritual renewal means to us. When you look at all the obstacles and the circumstances that are out there, spiritual renewal says that regardless of what is going on and how it's going on, I shall not be deterred from what God has called me to do. They continue to honor God in familiar ways. And when we do that for us, we have to think about that's how we get our stability. 
God gives us a, a level playing field. God uh, flattens some things that are in the way. God takes our focus many times off the difficult situations that we're in and cause us to understand, I'm with you. I'm with you and I'm working even though you can't see what I'm working. Uh, uh, Jeremiah in uh, Jeremiah 6 and 16, this says, this is what the Lord says. So he gives them this encouragement. When the Holy Spirit begins to move in the body of believers, it is highly likely that new ideas and practices will emerge. Sometimes dramatic changes take place. So this is what Jeremiah says. He says, I love this. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. You will find rest for your souls. Yes, these are troubled times that we live in. Yes, none of the news is good. You know, Saturday, we heard about a massacre of people, innocent people, a slaughter of innocent people shopping for groceries. It's happening so often. We, we've heard of churches absolutely being shot, shot up, locked down so that I can shoot more people and they can't escape. So when we look at this, uh, we still, God shows us the path and our response has to be, yes, Lord, amen. Yeah, we, we still, we will have troubled times here and God is not gonna tell us that we are not because we will. And so new spiritual beginnings with God must focus on building his temple. And, and I'm, I'm not speaking uh, necessarily here of a building. We have to build this temple because remember in last week's lesson, I said that worship comes from the inside out, not from the outside in. Uh, God spiritually inhabits our praise. God has the Holy Spirit to inhabit our hearts, to give us strength, to show us the way. So when, when he says, when Jeremiah says, we will find rest for our souls, yes, we are, we are walking in a weary land, a land that is full of all kinds of traps and, and entrapments. But in order for us to have new spiritual beginnings, we have to begin by focusing on building his house. And we know we are a New Testament church and the New Testament church tells us my body is the temple of the Lord. Amen. So uh, in uh, Ezra uh, 3, 6 and 7, it says, from the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings and the offerings to the Lord, although the foundation of the temple had not been laid. They also gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food, drink and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre to bring cedar logs from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa, according to the permission which they had from Cyrus, the king of Persia. So he allowed them to bring things with them for this. And they didn't try to hold on and hold back. Uh, they, they gave it, they gave freely of it for the building of the temple. Verse six implies that, that while their new beginning of rebuilding the altar was good, that it was, you know, we, we looked at, at when it said in uh, six, they kept, on, they kept on sacrificing and they kept on worshiping and that was good. But the people knew that they were going to have to give more and they had not yet laid the foundation of the temple. And this is, is the joy that they came. You know, the, the, the young people, um, are rejoicing, but the older people are looking at it saying, hey, we still need the temple. So the verses contain three references to the temple and five where it is called the Lord's house. The temple or house of the Lord was the place where he dwelled among his people. And that's what they had been taught. He manifested his glory to them in the temple. He, <coughs> excuse me, his people went there to offer sacrifices for forgiveness, but thank God thank God almighty, we have Jesus Christ. And so we can come to him. The remarkable thing is that we as God's church are now his temple or house where he dwells in us and walks among us. The building where we meet is not God's house. It is only the place where God's house gathers for worship. God's house gathers in the building 
This temple goes to the building for worship. God's temp house or temple can be, can be in a private home or in a park or a barn or a cathedral, but we need to remember that the place isn't sacred. The people are sacred. When, when even two or three of God's people gather in the name of Jesus, he is there in their midst. That's what Jesus himself told us in Matthew 18 and 20. The application is that you need a new beginning with God. And yes, I know we always say I can just do bedside Baptist, but the word says don't try to do it alone. There is a sense, of course, in which any new beginning must be intensely private. That's Yeah, that is where we start. But you must go to the Lord in private. We must confess and personally appropriate the shed blood of Christ. I got to know I'm covered in it. You must personally get into God's word and begin to obey it in your daily life. Starting on the thought level, if you have not started there, you can go to church meetings every day of the week, but you will simply be reinforcing hypocrisy in your life, putting on a good front to others while your private life is a messy mess. But once we've begun this, this uh, to renew ourselves in our private life, once we have begin, begin, begun to spiritually transform ourselves, uh, to renew our minds, uh, to offer our body as a, a, a living sacrifice, then we have built a commitment. We have built a foundation to God. And because of God's spirit, that foundation is unshakable. Without the commitment to other believers, the world, the flesh, and the devil will take us over. Hebrews 10 and 5, and everybody always says, some people say, tell me where it says that. Uh, preacher, tell me where it says that that we, we, we got to go to church. Well, I'm going to tell you, 1025, and I'm reading the Amplified Version, says that we are to not forsake our meeting together as believers for worship and instruction, and is as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and more even faithfully, as you see the day of Christ's return approaching. Yeah, it says that in the word. We are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves. Iron cannot sharpen iron if it's not two pieces of iron together. So in verse six, God establishes this. God's priorities tell us in verse six, basically that is what he's saying. Hey, y'all's priorities yet, their priority was to build that temple. But that wasn't God's priority. The people had waited a long time for the opportunity to build the altar in the temple. But in verse six, first verse six, I'm sorry, I can't even get it out. We read first that they had to offer to God, offer to the Lord, even though the temple foundation was not even laid yet. The people's relationship with God was of greater importance than the practical task that needed to be done. Yeah, they needed some walls to be able to gather because they didn't want to be out in the rain and, 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 and uh, all kinds of elements. But yes, the most important thing was still worship. So the relationship with God makes us understand to underline that yes, things need to be done, but not before or in front of worship. Those of us who are doers rather than waiters might have a motto, you know, Nike with that little thing says, just do it. But you can't just do it. You've got to make sure that your priority follows God's priority. That's where a church needs its prayers and a prophetic voice. We need, uh, we need to listen to uh, what the man of God is telling us. Today, there's an emphasis on instant gratification. You want it, you can have it plus instant communications. You got emails, text messages, smartphones, computers, smart watches. Uh, I mean, there, there is such a way to stay in touch, but the only way you're going to stay in touch with God is through your praise, your prayer, and your worship. Today, uh, waiting, say, uh, saving carefully, even deliberately depriving ourselves of something to foster patience, and self-discipline, basically I'm talking about prayer and fasting, you all. Sometimes we have to put some of those things that we gratify ourselves with instantly uh, out of our mind. 
I used to tease and, and tell uh, Sunday school class, I try not to keep sugar butter and eggs in the house at the same time. Because if I get too upset, I'll be in there baking. So if I don't have the right combination, I can't do that to gratify myself. So we have to sometimes wait. Waiting can, uh, uh, can be attributed to self-discipline. And there is nothing worse than an undisciplined Christian. Yeah. Because we don't expect uh, a disciplined unbeliever. But we definitely expect a well-disciplined, spiritually disciplined believer. And, and then the other thing for us to remember, uh, verse 6 teaches us this. God is not in a hurry. I, 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 I just can't even imagine. In my mind, I can't even picture that God would say, hurry up. Hurry up. God says, now, look, I want you to get there because when you get there in my timing, in my timing, it's going to last. Um, the king's business requires haste, but not rush. We should see when you get ur urgent, sometimes when you get to rushing, you get frantic and you start uh, doing things that would not be acceptable or pleasing to God in your, in, in your rush to get it done. Waiting is often used by God to teach us important lessons. So they had to wait to build the temple. Most, uh, Moses spent half a lifetime, think about this. Moses spent half of his lifetime as a shepherd. Joseph went to prison. Joseph thought he was getting ready to get called up. Look, yes, indeed, elevated, lifted up, and, and none of that happened. Uh, when he was told, yeah, I'm going to remember you, you know, when I get to the king's palace. But look, Joseph wound up in jail and being in jail for a while. And then we know Paul spent 12 years in Arabia prior to his ministry. Jesus told us, Jesus even said, count the cost before we begin a project. Because he always says, what man will start a house when he does not have the means or the resources to finish it. We are to use our brains, experience, and godly wisdom in making decisions. They don't normally come in dreams, angelic visitations, or prophecies, even though they might. God might speak to us. I, I, I won't limit how God might speak to us. Waiting is not the same as indecision or indifference. The only reason I'm waiting is just I'm going to see how, what the outcome is going to be. I'm not going to try to do anything in the meantime, like these uh, Israelites are doing. They were praising and offering sacrifices. I'm just going to wait to see what happens. How is it that a solution to an insurmountable problem comes after a night's sleep or doing a walk along the beach? An army spends most of its time preparing for the battle, not in the battle preparing for the battle. A boxer might spend only 10 minutes in the ring, but has spent months training. We need to be spiritually fit so that when God says move, we are wearing the full armor and in the best condition to fight. Jesus shows us the right attitude. Nevertheless, not my will, yes, but your will be done. Spiritual renewal allows us to see that everyone has a part to play in kingdom work. Everyone has a part to play. I don't care if you're a pew sitter right now, you still have got a part to play. Uh, it, it says this <clears throat> about God's kingdom work in Ezra chapter three, verses eight through nine. It says, now in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, Jeshua and the son of Josedach, and the rest of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all those who had come out of captivity to Jerusalem. Now, it started out talking about the leadership. It started out talking about the priest. But y'all get this. And all those who had come out of the captivity to Jerusalem began work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. Then Jeshua with his sons and brothers, Cadmiel and his sons and the sons of Judah arose as one 
to oversee those working on the house of God, the sons of Hinnadad with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. This was not a small scale movement. It took everyone. There was a large scale involvement. People used their God-given talents and the skills they had developed over the years to benefit the work of building the temple to benefit the place where they could come together as the word says, forsake not the assembling of yourself to praise God. And there was an atmosphere of expectancy. What are you expecting from this? Their expectancy was that God was working and would honor their commitment. Now, sometimes, you know, uh, we do all that we can and we don't get to see the glory of it, but that does not mean that the glory does not come. We get a strong sense that no one was sitting on the sidelines. Even if you're looking at, and you all know I like football, even when you're watching a football game, there is not anybody trying to sit down. If you watch a basketball game, most of the players are standing up. They do this, why? Because on the sidelines, you're encouraging those who are in there doing the work. Even if you're not actively involved at the time, our, our role is to sharpen each other. It's not a spectator sport. So some people were at the front, others were behind the scenes, but they were all involved in the same endeavor. This is what I like about spiritual renewal, a, a, a new spiritual beginning. Everybody is called on to get involved. We are not all gifted with great talents, but you know what we need to do? We need to recognize the talent that we have been gifted with. There is no minimal, there is no maximum kind of talent. God's talent is talent and it is used for the purpose of glorifying God and that is good enough. So uh, at the moment, we all have a role to play in the kingdom. No one is too frail, no one is too young, and no one should be too busy to exclude themselves. Your phone call, your card, your smile, your willingness to listen, your uh, uh, efforts in showing love and support to those on the front line is vitally important, vitally important. Of course, Mistakes will have to be made in the reconstruction process because people aren't perfect. We cannot hold a mistake against a person for the rest of their life. And we do try to do that. In church, we're too ready to pounce on someone when things go wrong, instead of showing understanding and care. And to give younger folks a chance to make their own mistakes. We want to tell and dictate to the younger folks how the older folks have always done it and forget that all of us were young ones. Briefly, a mention of, uh, of these other lessons are also found in uh, Ezra chapter three. Foundations need to be solid. Verse 10 says, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. These are the things that they also did when Solomon led them in praise when the temple had finally been finished uh, back uh, in, in, king, in, uh, in the book of Kings. There is no substitute for reading the Bible regularly and expecting that God will speak. Can't substitute that. Buildings collapse because the foundations are too shallow. We will collapse because our foundation in God is too shallow. You let a storm come, we're going down like a ton of bricks because our foundation is not rooted in God. Praying continually, turning to God throughout the day as to, to him as the one who lives within me and is closer than a brother. Getting in the habit of praising God at every twist and turn of life. We're not gonna always stay in the storm. Storms don't last. We may have multiple storms, but there is a recovery time in between those storms. And exercising your spiritual muscle by being active and serving one another and living so that others see that Jesus Christ is real and that God's spirit changes life. Yes, 
Our foundation is in Jesus Christ and we must get deep, deep. Our roots must get deep so that we can stand firm, stand firm through the storm, through the tornado, through the hurricane, uh, because we don't all have the same level of storm, but I guarantee you a storm is coming. And then in verses 11 through 13, God must always be given the glory. Don't, don't try to steal no glory from God because God must always receive all of the glory. Look at what the people did. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to God for he is good for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's house, old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of weeping of the people. For the people shouted with, one sh with a loud shout and the sound was heard afar off. Their voice, as they say sometimes in the choir, they were one voice. They were in unity. That's, that's what they were doing. Uh, the people gave a great shout and sang aloud. God is worthy, y'all, despite our circumstances. Now think about this. Yes, they have finished the temple. And this was something that they were looking forward to. Uh, having having this, this house of worship, this place to go to, they look forward to that. But think about it. They are giving these loud shouts. They are so joyful. They are weeping with joy. Uh, you know, and it said, it said because the foundation of the house of God was laid. Are you joyful that your foundation in the Lord has been laid? The people gave this shout. Why? Because it is saying that God is worthy despite our circumstances. Our feelings our situations don't change that God should be praised. Let that sink in for a moment. Our situation does not change that God should be praised because your storm has not been always. Your situation has not been always. You have not always been out of a job. You have not always been hungry. You have not always been in a state of grief. You have not always been in a state of sickness. Uh, and, and even if these things, we will say it, even if these things for us are to death, we have a promise from the Lord. He said that where I go, I go to prepare a place for you. We are not going to be left without. God has a place for us, even if our storms here may get to be too great. The principle is clear for us. If we are going to build our lives on a solid foundation, if we are going to be spiritually renewed, this is what has to get into us. This has to be the principle of our praise. He is worthy to receive honor and glory. Our feelings and situations can impact our attitude. I might not have a smile for a few minutes, but they do not change the nature of God's worthiness. They, they don't change God's goodness. They don't change God's his kindness. They don't change God's mercy. Uh, our situation doesn't change God's grace. It does not change God's love. It does not change God's protection. It does not change God's comfort. Nothing can change the attributes of God because the word says there is no turning in him. Kingdom work then should stir up our emotions. Spiritual renewal, spiritual growth, Spiritual, new spiritual beginnings should stir up our emotions. You know, we are excited when we see baptism. We clap when people come and bring their life to Christ, but it should not be for just a moment. It should be lifelong. We should have that kind of excitement in the Lord every day. If we believe that people might be heading for a lost eternity, 
it should break our hearts and cause us distress. And compassion for those who suffer should stir us to move us to action. That is how people get through their storm. Those things, uh, as they say, compassion should not fail in us. Uh, mercy should not fail in us because we have a, received an abundance of mercy already. We have received an abundance of grace already. And you know what the word says? It does not it is inexhaustible. God's grace and mercy, the goodness twins will take you all the way through. In verse 12, we read that many of the older priests and Levite, Levites and heads of families wept aloud when they saw the temple foundation being laid. Uh, you know, they are remembering an old time. And then the others cried out loud for joy. If we are going to be spiritually renewed, there is little value in nostalgia. Looking back should only be a reflection of what God has done for us. It does not mean that when we look in nostalgia that we are wallowing in regret because we are always moving forward and understanding that God is always has something. There is a great value in thanking God for what he has done before. And even in the past, it makes the past seem brighter than the future sometimes. That's how we should look at it. The chapter though ends on a positive note, young and old together, celebrating the love of God and note that they celebrated so loudly. They celebrated so uh, realistically. They celebrated so humbly. They, they lifted their voice in one accord. And it says the sound was so loud that it was heard far away. It doesn't it doesn't say how far away, but I can just imagine that we would celebrate uh, God on Sunday and that somebody driving down Murphy Lane or coming down Kentucky 22 or over by the Ford truck plant would go, shh, shh, what is that? That would be us all together in one voice. So a body of God's people working together, loving one another, recognizing gifts, being encouraging, praying for each other, serving one another, and praising God together. That's how we become spiritually new. And that church is how a New Testament church gets to be on the move. I thank you for participating. Uh, if you will just join me in prayer here, uh, we will end our study. Gracious and all wise Father, God, we give you glory. We thank you, God, uh, that even in dark times, God, you never leave or forsake. We don't know, God, whose heart you are touching on our behalf. And, and God, we don't know uh, when, when you touch our hearts on other behalves, God, make us move forward, God, make us take action. As I said at the beginning, Ezra is an action chapter. Ezra chapter three is an action chapter. It is all about us taking action to move closer to you. We cannot be spiritually renewed, God. We cannot be spiritually revived, God. We cannot spiritually return to you lest we are willing to let you move us in the direction that we need to go. So God, we thank you in advance uh, for your word, God. We thank you for your covering. We thank you for your keeping, God. There is no one like you, God, and we declare it. We declare there is truly no one like you. There is no one who loves us more than you, God. And so, God, we want to give you that love, that glory, and honor in return. It is in Jesus' mighty and matchless name we pray. Amen. Thank you for viewing the Green Castle Baptist Church, the Church Under the Cross online worship experience. We pray that you have been blessed by our ministry. Green Castle Baptist Church is located at 4970 Murphy Lane in Louisville, Kentucky. Visit us again and please view our other services on our website at www.greencastle.org. May the Lord bless you and keep you is our prayer.